escape, escape, as in to, to run away, not solve the problem. It's the 1950s. His name is Ronald. Ronald lives in San Quentin, California. He lives in San Quentin because, well, that's where the prison is. He's in prison. He's sitting in his cot one day, he's staring up at the ceiling, and Ronald begins to think, man, how did I end up here? He begins to think about the days. He said, well, you know, it started out, I did a little shoplifting. Okay, yeah, a few pieces. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that's true. I, 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 did, I did steal more than just a few things. And then, yeah, I, okay, okay, yeah, I did write hot checks, a few. And I, yeah, all right, so I carjacked several. And then, well, okay, yeah, I did rob the store, or some. And then he says, man, how did, it's just amazing how quick life fell from me. And now all of a sudden, here I am, I got two years left on my term, and man, I just can't take it anymore. It's just the world is closing in, the walls, everything is a problem. And then his friend comes to him in prison. His friend's name is Rabbit. And Rabbit says, look, you and I work in the manufacturing shop. We make desks, we make chairs, we make credenzas, we make furniture. Tomorrow, there will be an order placed for a desk. It's going to weigh close to 1,000 pounds for this judge. You and I are supposed to build it. Here's the deal. You and I, whatever we weigh is immaterial. If we can put ourselves in the desk late at night, close it in, when they bring the forklift, it'll never know there's extra weight. You and I are going to escape. It's going to be tomorrow. Man, all night long, Ronald will tell you, man, he just doesn't know what to do. He said every time he's given his life to somebody, they've always let him down, including, and most importantly, himself. And he says, even to this day, it may sound tongue-in-cheek to you now, but I decided that the only way I would ever escape this prison, instead of with Rabbit, who has like two life sentences back to back, the only way I'll escape this, Lord, is if you take control. He said he falls asleep on his cot, he doesn't even make it to get there to make the desk or to finish it. Rabbit finishes it and gets inside and escapes. 30 days go by, 60 days go by, 90 days go by. He's still in the fab shop doing his thing, working off his time. And then the announcement comes over that the one that escaped, Rabbit, was finally caught. Got a speeding ticket, ran through an intersection. Got into a big brouhaha with the policeman. Shots were fired. He kills the officer. He's now coming back to be executed. And man, all of a sudden, Ronald says, man, if I just hadn't, quote, given my life to Christ, if I haven't escaped through Christ, I would be in the exact same spot. He said, man, the years went by. It was slow. But as finally his buddy comes, Chris Christopherson, picks him up to bring him home. He said him and Chris start talking. They start talking about different things, and music is what they have in common. And then all of a sudden, Chris introduces him to Dolly Parton, who introduces him to Johnny Cash, and next thing you know, man, he's coming up with songs. He had the theme song for Platoon. He did the theme song for the show called Radio. He did another theme song called uh, for Chisholm, the Western, of which none of you know anything about, but that's okay. As a result, he comes up with other songs. And Brother and Sister in Christ, he was called the common man's poet. And matter of fact, he came up with songs like uh, Mama, I Tried, came up with... Uh, that's the way love is. He came up with Ogie from Muskogee. And since very little of y'all ever listen to country music, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, yes, Ms. you know him. You know Ronald is Merle Haggard, my brothers and sisters in Christ. But he will tell you that the only way to escape a problem is to solve it. And the only way to solve it, in his words, not mine, is Christ. My brothers and sisters in Christ, that is exactly that gospel. Think about what's going on. The apostles are in the city of Jerusalem. This happens first and foremost on Easter Sunday and then repeats it a week later. Brothers and sisters in Christ, they are in a locked room thinking, thinking that they're going to escape the persecution of the Jews, persecution of Pilate, by simply locking the door, their version of escape. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the good Lord walks through the door. He shows them immediately that he is divine by walking through a locked door. And isn't it amazing that on Easter Sunday, he's got to show the apostles his wounds for... They didn't believe either. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this shows up a week later when Thomas is there. But make sure you understand. Remember now, brothers and sisters in Christ, make sure you understand the whole concept of Pentecost. Penta is 50, as you well know. Brothers and sisters in Christ, from the Passover, the Last Supper, 50 days later is the Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of the First Fruits, 
where you and I came for the Passover meal, the Last Supper, if you will, and then 50 days later, we're bringing our first fruits to offer up to the good Lord. So brothers and sisters in Christ, from the Passover meal, the Last Supper, to the 40th day when the good Lord ascended into heaven, make sure you understand this, brothers and sisters in Christ. The next nine days after the 40th day, the apostles are in prayer for Feast of Pentecost. Those nine days, that's where you get and I get the nine-day novena from brothers and sisters in Christ. Man, it is scriptural, as are all things of our faith. My brothers and sisters in Christ, and remember, if you're a first-century Jew, and you hear the words on the first day of the week, as a first-century Jew, you immediately default to Genesis. On the first day, quote of the week, that's a Sunday, God creates creation or initiates it on day one. Hence, the new creation on Easter Sunday. It's not ironic that all the big miracles took place on Sunday. The resurrection, the transfiguration, the wedding of Cana, the woman at the well. Holy day is Sunday. Not any day you and I choose. And brothers and sisters in Christ, is it not yet amazing that he actually breathes on them to receive the Holy Spirit? Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're a first century Jew, and if you didn't catch the first day of the week, and then you heard that he breathed on them, brothers and sisters in Christ, you go all the way back to Genesis, when the good Lord breathes life into Adam. As a first century Jew, how many coincidences do you need to get it? My brothers and sisters in Christ, isn't it amazing that one of the first things that he starts is confession, telling his 12, 11 if you will, whatever sins you forgive are forgiven. And whatever you retain or retain, he never said, skip y'all and go directly to me. He never heard a confession. He never baptized either. He is initiating all gifts come from him. That goes without saying. But there is a means of which to distribute the graces. My brother and sister in Christ, and make sure too that you understand, brother and sister in Christ, at Pentecost, when they now receive the Holy Spirit, please remember, now all of a sudden their journey begins and they realize that the only escape in this world is through him. Say what you want about Thomas being a doubter until I stick my fingers in his hands and my hands in his side. He did get speared to death, brothers and sisters in Christ. So here we sit, brothers and sisters in Christ. Go back through the history of mankind. Go back through scripture. All our best players, all the people involved in the world, you have to make a decision. Are you going to escape or solve the problem with Christ? Or are you going to try to solve it with your own means, with your own intellect? I mean, because we got game. We're not like those 2,000 years ago. We're far more superior. We have more talents. We have more gifts. We have better science. We have better doctors, physicians, attorneys, and all the things that are needed. But the instance, at the end of the day, all things begin and end with him. If I could pick seven wanted posters, I would take the seven deadly sins. Pride, anger, gluttony, lust, avarice, sloth, and envy. I would make a wanted poster for each one of these. Why? Because they show to you and I 2,000 years later what happens when you and I think we can solve our own problems. If we could solve our own problems, we would have already done so. My brothers and sisters in Christ, if you want to talk about pride, it would be a poster child of Adam and Eve. They too wanted to be like God. If you wanted to pick anger, I'd pick Cain. I mean, why is he upset at his brother, Abel? Just because Abel brings his best fruit and you bring your, ec your extra fruit because you saved the best for you. Man, he becomes the first murderer. Well, maybe it's gluttony. You know, like the rich man that wouldn't feed Lazarus, the poor man, let the dog lick his wounds. Man, he's a poster child. That man's in hell this day. Well, man, maybe it's, maybe it's lust. You know, the one that John the Baptist was giving Herod the grief over. You married your brother's wife, but you don't care about the laws because, well, I mean, you're a king, Herod. Man, is that where we're at? Well, maybe, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's all about the money. That'd be a poster child for Judas. I mean, 30 pieces of silver. I mean, the price of a slave. Well, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's envy. Maybe it's like Herod the Great. They referred to him as king of the Jews. I don't care how many kids I kill. I'm getting to that savior so that I can keep my title. Man, my brothers and sisters in Christ, here you and I sit 2,000 years later. My brothers and sisters in Christ, ask yourself these questions. What is it going to take for you and I to understand the only way to escape the world's problems is to solve them with Christ and to solve them with prayer? How do you think you're going to solve the problems of your children? 
You think you're going to solve them by your own merits? We've seen where that's gone. They have free will, regrettably. How about the world in the which we work in? Man, are you going to solve those problems by yourself, your boss, your co-workers? If you had been, you'd already done them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, how are you going to solve the problems of your family, the relationship, your health, the doctor's visit, the taxes you owe, the bills that are paid, the contract, the work, the world in which we live, the teachers, our grades? Brothers and sisters in Christ, don't you see? We'll never solve the problems on our own. That's the whole problem. We think we're just that good and that God is a great lotto king. If we pray at the end of the day after it's all said and done, well, look, you might as well pray to him. We got nothing else to lose. Would you respond to that prayer? You're the last person and not the first result. Don't you see? The fight has never been between you and I or between us and them. The fight is between good and evil. It's well above our head. So if you don't bring the good Lord into the equation, the evil one is going to dominate our game. He is going to be in everything that we do. He will generate more anxiety and worry in your life you couldn't stay in the day if we could spell the word day. We are so consumed with things that we think we can control. First, we got to try and get our hands around him. Then we got to reach out to people that we think could help. Then we got to talk to those that may know a little better if we can find those that are better than we are at the spot. And then we're going to try and put it all together and line it all up and only pitch it to Christ when all else fails. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we will never solve the problems of this world without bringing Christ into the equation. It was never meant to be that way that you and I would do it on our own. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, Moses, King David, King Solomon, all the way up to today. It all begins and ends with Christ. Nothing has changed in the world. And you know what's the greatest thing he's given Mother Church? He's given us the sacraments so that he can give you and I the grace to fight the fight. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you understand that almost every sacrament has an outward sign? Yet we make fun of Thomas. Like, oh, he had to see the wounds. But brothers and sisters in Christ, you ever ask yourself why the sacraments have the outward sign? The water that I pour on your child's head in baptism. Is that for the child? Is it for you and I? It's to let you and I know when the sin was removed. The water is the ancillary. It's the outward sign of the inward reality. Brother says, Christ, why do you think the bells ring? The bells don't do anything per se other than let you know that heaven and earth touched during the consecration. Brother says, Christ, when you go to confession, and you're not going to yourselves. You hear the words, your sins are forgiven, go in peace. There's the outward sign. You actually hear it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when you get married, you wear a ring. The outward sign of something that has taken place inwardly. Why do you think you consume the host? So that is something that you will eat internally. Brothers and sisters in Christ, he gave us the sacraments so that you would know he was in the game. Whenever you feel like you've gotten so angry, mad, temperamental, you start to grow away from our Savior, you're moody, you curse more, I can tell you. You had not been in confession. My brothers and sisters in Christ, how many times do you see me use incense at Mass? Do you not understand from the book of Revelations that petitions rise to our good Lord like incense rises before his throne as angels incense his throne singing glory to God in the highest? Oh, oh, I get it. You think I use incense just to make you cough. I tell you, someday I'm not going to put any incense in it. I'm still going to shake it, and you're still going to cough, and that's going to happen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I leave you with this. You want to solve the world's problems? You want to escape them, and the only way to escape them is to solve them. The only way to solve them is to pray for them. The only way to get anything out of this world and get where you need to be and to leave the rest behind, escape it if you will, is to bring our Savior in the equation. You get so mad at night because he's not answering your prayers, you're so exhausted tonight, you can't say one more prayer. You pray for your children, and then you turn around and look at me and say, Father, what's the point? You pray for this job, and you didn't get it. You pray for the contract, you didn't get it. He's not listening, he doesn't care, he doesn't exist. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when you're so tired, you can't pitch it one more time, one prayer out of your lips when you're totally exhausted, and when you want to throw in the towel, that's where the fight will be made. From your lips to his ears. To escape means to solve it, and to solve it, is to pray. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.